My name is David Summerfleck. For over 20 years, I worked as a digital marketing agency project manager and consultant where I helped business owners go from failure and ruin to reinvesting profits. Now I'm interviewing other experts and professionals to find out what makes them tick and get their thoughts on how you can learn from their experiences and revitalize your life professionally and personally. We cover topics as wide ranging as digital marketing, business innovation, culture, global trends, and ways we can all better channel our creativity. So let's join the discussion. And hello there. Thank you for joining me for another episode. My yeah. guest today is Ari Golper. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. Ari is the world's leading authority on trust-based selling and is one of the most experienced sales growth advisors in the world. He's the creator of Unlock the Game, a revolutionary new sales approach that overturns the notion of selling as we know it today. Uh, he has clients in over 35 countries. His global sales systems have become the most successful trust-based selling system of our time. Ari has been featured in CEO Magazine, Sky News, Forbes, Inc. Magazine, and the Australian Financial Review. It's specifically for business owners, consultants, and sales professionals who struggle with converting potential clients into paid clients. Many focus on growing their networks, having more conversations, and then converting them into paying clients. But that continues to be problematic for many. Um, Ari's lessons that you will learn today is that you lose the sale not because you haven't demonstrated enough value, but because you haven't created enough trust. So Ari, thank you for taking some time to talk with us today. I want to dig into all of that. Sure, Dave, let's do it. Okay, so let's start with my first question is, I like to start with the basics and just kind of learn more about you as a person, you know, as a human being. How did you come to gain the sales experience that you have? And then how did you, when did you reach that point where you felt comfortable saying, yeah, I'm an expert in sales, I can say this? Well, there's a story behind this actually that, that kind of tells the whole story as to how it kind of leapfrogged me uh, into this role, uh, which I can share with you if you like. But sure. Uh, about 20 years ago, I was a, a sales manager in a software company. We launched the first online website uh, data collection tools now called, called Google Analytics. Uh, back and um, back then, it was a free product. I said cost money back then. Now it's free. But uh, I was managing 18 people underneath me at the time, and. Um, I, uh, had, the leads came across my desk, the big opportunities and the one contact called in and I got the phone call and a uh, big opportunity, uh, this, he worked for a big company, uh, they had lots of websites. So, and if I close this one sale, it would double the revenue of the company in one transaction. That's how big it was. So he agreed to a conference call and a lab demo, uh, for the week later to show them our product. And the day finally came, uh, it was five o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday and I was in my conference room with my CEO. I closed the door behind me. There's a big long table in the middle of the table uh, and there's a speakerphone and I dial the number for the conference call and he picks it up. He says, hello, Ari. He said, hey, John, how's it going? Good. And he says to me, Ari, let us tell you who's with, with us today on the phone. And I said, great. Next thing I hear is, my name's John. I'm CEO. I was like, ooh, this is good. My name's Mike. I'm head of IT. This is even better. My name's Julia. I'm head of global marketing. This is amazing. So everybody on this call was essentially a decision maker. Right, the key decision time, makers. Right? If it's going to happen, it's going to happen now. So I introduced myself to everybody. I started giving a live demo of our of our services, and I'm showing this to them live. And I'm starting to hear this noise in the phone. They're like, "Wow, this is great. This is amazing. This is fantastic." Mm -hmm. They're asking me all kinds of questions. How does it work? How do we install it? And of course, I had all the right kinds of answers. I was competent at the time, and there was so much chemistry on this phone call, Dave. It was like a love fest on the phone. You know what I'm talking about? Like just so much chemistry there going back and forth. And the hour goes by, they're really happy. And the call comes to a close. And my contact says to me, Ari, this is great. We love it. 
Give us a call a couple weeks, follow up with us, and we'll move this thing forward. And uh, I was like, I couldn't be happier. So I said my goodbyes, and I took my hand, and I reached for the speakerphone, the off button. As I'm reaching for the off button, by complete accident, I hit the mute button instead of the off button right next to each other. And a small click happened, and they thought I hung up the phone. And that split second, a voice inside of me said, Ari, go to the dark side. Be a fly in the wall. Listen, you got nothing to lose. And they started talking amongst themselves, thinking I had left the call. So what would you imagine that were heard in that call? What would you expect to, to for them, they would probably would have told me after a call like that? What would they have said to each other, do you think? Either how do we want to begin this process of, you know, uh, enrolling him in how we work and onboarding him and, you know, who's over going to, who's going to oversee project development. That's what you would think. Who's going to head this up or the flip side is this is just, we're not into it. You, you exactly. And, and yes, we expect to hear, but let me tell you what they said verbatim word for word. I'll never forget. That's why we're here today. What they said was this. They said, we're not going to go with him keep using him for more information and make sure we shop someplace else cheaper knife in heart. I was in a state of shock. Yeah. I finally hit the off button. I love the wall and I said to myself, what did I do wrong? I was competent. I was trustworthy. I was honest. And the first big idea hit me. That was this. I realized that moment that somewhere along the way that has become socially acceptable not to tell the truth to people who sell. Right? It's yeah. okay to say things like, sounds good, send me information. I'm definitely interested. Oh, wait, send me a proposal without having any intention of buying at all. And it's, it, I think everyone who is a service provider has had that happen and probably had that happen multiple times. I, I've certainly had that happen. I mean, not working so much for the agencies that I worked for, but in between those agency positions, working as a, as a freelance web developer and digital marketer, I had that happen many times. And it's, it's a real gut punch, you know, cause yeah, you get, um, you get excited. You start identifying areas where you could really add value and really help that business. But then you realize they either don't understand or they're really not interested. All they're looking for is how cheap can I get this template? So whatever problems they have really have to persist. So it's I mean, it's hard. It's, it's dehumanizing. Actually, it feels yeah. like, a, like you said, a gut punch. And that's when I, and I realized that moment I said, asked myself, why is this going on? And I realized the epiphany I had was this, that there is an invisible river of this pressure that flows underneath every sales call you have with someone pre-sale. Yeah. And if you're unaware of the pressure, you're not taken out of, of the calls. What happens is you can't build trust with people. They feel like all you care about is your goal of the sale. You don't really care about them. So I invented a whole shift on this called Unlock the Game, where your goal is to let go of the end goal of the sale, but instead to focus on deep trust with someone so they feel comfortable and vulnerable enough to tell you the truth. And that became our whole trust based on movement that we started 20 years ago. Yeah, and that's a whole can of worms. I don't want to jump too far ahead, but can you backtrack a little bit and talk about the fact that I thought it was really interesting that you have a master's degree in instructional design. I want to not, you know, jump ahead too far, but I wanted to ask how that education, that formal education benefits your ability to work with others and try to structure conversations more thoroughly. And then I want to get back into what you had talked about before. That's a great question. And what that learning taught me at that degree level was how to parse out content in a way that learners can easily consume process and behaviorally change with. That's what I learned. And I, I took those concepts and embedded it instead of our process to help people learn how to do this very easily. So what does that look like? I mean, is it like a drip um, for people who work with you where they're basically led gradually through some kind of structured process or is it more outward facing 
you know, this is what you're going to do with your clients. And that's what you say to your students. It's more of a framework, more of a roadmap that we were able to organize everything in the chunks. So that's easy to consume and easy to use. And we do coaching with people or consulting. We walk them through those pieces where they can actually go apply one piece in between session. They get a result and they go, Oh, that's great. Now what we keep adding in these pieces to build it out. Right. I get you. It's, it's kind of like Pulp Fiction where they, they give you the story in, in pieces. Okay. Let me ask you about Aikido. I took Aikido in college and for several years and I, I loved it um, for what it was physically, but also for the philosophy of everything being circular. Could you touch on what your experience was with that and what it meant to you, how you benefit from it? <laughs> and maybe how you applied some of those principles, if you did, to what you do. Yeah, so Aikido, as you know, is a Japanese martial art, people don't know, that it's based upon the concept that when you're being attacked, uh, rather than defending yourself or overcoming it by pushing back or hitting back, you, you deflect and, and diffuse by taking their energy and pressure. At the end, hopefully no one gets hurt. That's the concept behind it. So I this work with that a while back and I embedded that entire philosophy inside of my trust based selling model and concept uh, where basically what we do is we have ways to basically activate that live in real conversation with people where you can diffuse the tension, diffuse the pressure rather than trying to overcome it, uh, try and push back on the pressure, you diffuse it and you reconnect again to build that trust. So the way Aikido reconnects with the the attacker essentially where you can blend together it's the same concept here i've taken the same principles embedded them inside of my what i call trust-based languaging and trust-based approach to help people connect with people in the sales process without trying to overcome the resistance okay when where do you see the impasse or obstacles today uh kind of on a related note with um, Aikido, when we talk about sales, where do you see the obstacles appearing uh, for the most part? I mean, if you're a business owner or service provider, where do you see the disconnect, uh, which kind of harkens back to what you were just saying a few minutes ago, you know, where you've got the business owner trying to sell their products or services to the customer they feel is a good fit for them, but the person buying the service or product they want the cheapest deal possible, not necessarily the best solution, because in a lot of cases they don't know. Uh, how do you fix that, you know, that miscommunication there that just seems to be par for the course now? It's almost like two shifts in the night passing each other. Because the reason why is because as the business owner, we've been conditioned with old behaviors that I'm thinking that our job is to convince and persuade someone to buy what we have. But the reality is this has to shift to what I call a doctor patient relationship where they've got the problem. You have a solution, but you cannot provide the solution until you diagnose their problem first. See what we do by mistake is that we sense we have an opportunity with someone or they're going to fit for us. We can't help ourselves, but to jump in and start selling and, uh, moving them to the next step and offering our services yeah. because we're excited about helping them, which is fine. But think about a doctor. When you go see a doctor and you say to them, my shoulder hurts, he says, let me take a look. Is it over here? Ah, oh, yeah. Oh, 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 wow. Okay. We need to get an x-ray on that right away to really uncover the source of the issue to really see how to solve this problem. See, the doctor doesn't just provide a prescription when you come in there and say, I got a problem. So he goes through a through diagnostic process to make sure that the medicine matches the problem. See, what we do in sales is we don't do that. When we hear they got an issue, they're qualified, we go, great, let me help you with that. And we're not getting the depth and scope of and the, trust and trust so that we can render that. So let me break that down if I can. How do you build that? I mean, obviously, that's a process. It's not a one and done thing. So we're in a culture where most people are accustomed to fast food consumerism. They want everything immediately. They want it all to be super cheap or free if at all possible. I certainly see that every day where people ask, well, how much is SEO? How much is a website? And they're taking the, the disconnected parts 
and they're not looking at the larger whole. They don't understand it's a process. So I guess what I'm trying to ask is where do you begin with that? Is it first we have to screen to see if we're a good fit for each other. Now you got to come back and we have to schedule the beginning of an onboarding process so we can talk about what your needs are, do a needs analysis, diagnose how we solve that. How do we structure that? Well, this is part of my new book I'm working on right now. Come out next year called The One Call Sale, where you compress your sales cycle into one conversation. And in that conversation, it contains a framework as if you're the doctor. And the way you, first of all, you handle this is you have to basically in your mind say to yourself, when they, when they have a call with you, you have to first say in, your, in the back of your mind, your first thought to yourself is they may not be a fit. Absolutely. Yeah, that's always... <laughs> You you yeah. always have to have that because you can't you don't want to get excited and think oh my god this would you know this would be great um, yeah I remember I had a, I had a, a a potential client once um, had a realistic budget uh, was extremely articulate very well educated very nice uh, person to talk to he knew what SEO was he knew all about content marketing he knew about the importance of responsive design everything he's ready to go budget was great then I said well sir I gotta know what is this business for and he said an escort service and I just said I, I in good conscience I can't do that you know, A, it could be illegal depending on where we live and B, I, I you know, I, I don't, I don't want to do that kind of thing, you know, so how do we, how do you separate this, the finding the client, but then screening them and then onboarding them, but you can't really do that all in one call, can you? Sure you can. Okay. I'm going to be quiet and let you fill that in because that's that's what what we need to hear. That's right. So we 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 are so conditioned and so used to multiple steps before we get the end goal of the yes or no. That's yep. wired into our brains. What you have to understand is the reason why you're not getting to the end goal on that first call is because they didn't trust you enough to give you a comfortable yes or no. That's why. It's you, It's our issue, not their issue. We just don't, we are never been taught before how to tighten up the process where it's focused only on them to give you enough information to help them build trust with them, to onboard them on the spot. So let me kind of give you a bit of a framework here of what this, what this looks like okay. that I now coach my clients on today. Um, essentially, let's, let, let's assume you have a scheduled call with somebody, okay? And let's assume... They're, they're not out of the range of within your your ideal client. They, they, they're fairly they're fairly qualified. They, they have a religion, legitimate business, basically, okay? Uh, they're not in the fringe. So um, how do you normally start a call like that with someone? How do you normally begin a, a, an initial call with a new prospect on the phone? How do, for you, how do you start it? Well, for, for me personally, first I would be polite and, you know, introductions, how are you? Every, that's great. Then I would just jump into it and just say, you know, let's uh, talk about what do you feel your goals are? What are you trying to achieve? All what right, have stop, you been stop, doing? Stop, 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 stop there. Stop there. That's the problem. Okay. What you're doing is you are leaping them to the future at yeah. hello. You're saying it's too much. What goal? Where do you want to be? Are you kidding me? They can't, they can't think past tomorrow. I mean, the, the current mindset of people today is like the next 10 minutes and you're taking their goals. What you have to do is flip the model. So you're not selling the future anymore, but you're focused on the problems that they have currently that they want to solve. So the way your call should begin is like this. It should go, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. And you ask permission. If it's okay with you, can we start with you walking me through a little bit about your situation, a bit about your story, and your current business challenges, and we'll go from there. Okay. Very open ended. You you open ended thing, but you ended on problems and your challenges. You want to hear right. their current problems, not what they think they need. Clients don't know what they need. They know what they want, but they can't explain what they need. And we can't 
use them as the expert. They're not qualified to decide what they need. That's your job as a doctor to decide what they need, not to accept yeah. what they have to say. Very true. Very true. And I see that all the time where the clients are directing the conversation. It's kind of like the RFP thing where they tell you, this is how much it should cost. This is how long it should take. These are the tools that you should use. But wait a minute, are you an expert in this? Are you an expert in digital marketing? Do you know about SEO, e-commerce, content marketing? And the answer, of course, is no. So why are you leading the conversation? But I get what you're saying, too, is that you have to start very broad. Tell me about your problems. Tell me what your situation is. Now, the comeback to that would be, what do you do if the client tells you, I just need a website. I just need this. I don't have any problems. Everything is great. All right. Uh, let's just, let's just role how play much? right now. How much? Let's role play, let's role play right now. Okay. okay? I'll be you. Okay. And you be the you be the customer you you're imagining in your mind. So tell me you, you be the customer. Tell me that now what you you're imagining here. Ari, I just need a website. How much is a website? Why, uh, why do you need a website? Uh, because I want to be number one in the Google, and, and I want people to find my website. That's all. Just having web, just having website won't solve that problem. Well, why not? I can just go to Wix or Weebly and get one for free. Of course you can. But it won't solve the problem of being number one in Google. It's more complex than that. Really? Okay, nobody ever told me that. I thought it was, you know, me. Well, I would tell you that because usually they're offering low price point services for free. That's why. Okay. So that's where we begin. So so just, just add a role play for a minute. Mm. What I am doing here is telling you the truth. Right. And it and, and, no, I agree. And, and I, I'm not going to bend to what you want because you aren't qualified to even know what you want. You don't even know what it is. You, you don't have any context of the complexity of what's involved here at all. So what I am doing is questioning the premise of their own question as being ridiculous. Well, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And I, you know, to me personally, that's, basically saying change your onboarding it would change your screening and onboarding and basically combine them and make them very open-ended very broad and just well, only, only in the beginning only, only in the beginning, beginning and so then winnow it down here's how it works okay so you yeah. remember you're the doctor they're the patient they are not the doctor they are they don't they're not qualified they didn't go to medical school they cannot prescribe anything themselves so when they say to you, so uh, here's my story, here's my business, here's my problem, I don't have a website or and whatever, then you're gonna say this, you're gonna say, well, what business challenges are you looking to solve by having a website? Right. And they're gonna say to you, well, uh, we wanna get some more leads to our business. And you're gonna say this, can you tell me a little bit more about that right now they do that and at some point before you agree to work with them and tell me if i'm wrong i mean or, or tell me how you would do this at some point we've got to bridge the how much question you don't bridge the how much question until you identify the losses that are occurring by not solving the problem Okay. You have to amplify and ROI the issue first. You have to yeah. say, let me ask you a question. How much opportunity do you imagine you're losing right now by not having this taken care of? And I, you know, I, I do remember asking clients that question in the past, and I'm sure you know what the answer is. 99.9% .9 of the time, they have no idea. That's okay. I expect that. Yeah. Your job is to frame it then. Say, well, yeah. let's break this down. Let's break this down. I'd say, so what's the, if you do get leads that come in and you make a sale, how much do you make per, per sale usually? For, and they're going to say, they're going to say a number. Okay. Then you're going to say, how many leads a month should you be getting right now that you're not getting because you don't have a website? Right. And the client, how many, how many, 
How many do you expect to be getting at the minimum? And they'll tell you 10. Great. So as, as we're sitting here right now, not having this done, you're losing 10 a month on opportunities. Is that right? Yeah, pretty much. And, and every single client, if you sold that 10 would be worth how much to you? What's your average value per client? It says $5,000. Okay, so $5,000 times 10, 50 grand a month of opportunity you're not getting right now because you know, you're missing having these assets. Is that right? Uh, I guess so. Great. Well, the good news is it's only a fraction of the fee to solve this problem, a fraction of that total to solve this. You have to ROI the problem before you offer the price of the solution. Otherwise, no matter what price you tell them is, it's too expensive. Yeah, no, I agree. So let me ask you what, how much information is too much information? So if we go back to that experience that you had, you know, where the, you put the other client on mute, with what happened to you, and you know, obviously has happened to everybody who works with clients, was it a case of too much information too soon? I mean, that's probably part of it because they really couldn't take it in context, right? Well, people ask me where you're going with this. Is, I think you know, I know where you're, going with it. You're, you're asking me, you're really asking me the question this is if I knew what I knew now, 20 years ago, what would I have done differently? Yeah. To not get myself, not get myself in that pickle like that. And, and, and the answer to that is this, if I knew what I knew now, 20 years ago, I never would have had the phone call with them because on the first call with that guy, I would have done the one call sale and identified whether what their agenda was, whether they were fit or not, and whether we're going to work together or not. Okay. Um, on your website, well, let me see. You, you basically answered like three of my questions and already. So. Let me zip ahead a little bit here. So how do we stop giving away free consulting and over educating potential clients so that they will stop this? I don't want to say self destructive, but it really is in, 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 in some cases, how do we stop them from focusing on the cheapest price possible and then decide to select us as the choice? Now, I know it's about gaining the trust, but I mean, could you talk about how to basically try to get this as something that becomes rote? You know, so well, first you have to recognize that you have to decommoditize yourself and focus on your approach to the market because the world's become so commoditized now that customers see our products as commodities. Apples to apples, cheapest price, it's all the same. Insurance yeah. is insurance. Websites are websites. SEOs, SEOs. What's the difference? They don't know the difference. So by you attempting to educate them on the difference is a losing battle. Because there's they no... Are they yeah. are qualified to discern. They can't process what you're telling them to be valid. They don't know. They don't even trust you yet. And here we are trying to say, oh, we're different. We're this, we're this. See, what you have to understand is in the back of their mind psychologically, all they're thinking about in that call with you is one thing. Do I trust him? Do I trust him? Do I trust him? Do I trust him? They don't care about how you solve their problem. They don't care about your systems and your solutions and your teams offshore and the linkages and the websites. They, that to them is all gobbledygook. That's not their world. They don't live in it. See, we we live in it. All they want to know is, does this guy understand me? That goes back to being the doctor and unpacking their problems to the point where he says to himself, man, this guy is a truth teller. I, I, I resonate with him. And on top of that, he's not trying to move me to a sale. I like this guy and I'll pay him more than anybody else because I trust him over anybody else. I think this, I think one of the things too is emotionally 
if you're a service provider and what you do is very technical, you want to go in that direction. You want to talk about SEO, e-commerce options. You want to talk about the different widgets and the different tools. And you want to talk about these things and really geek out on it, you know, that you love. And I think, you know, and we know the work that we could do. So we get really anxious and excited and just want to, hey, I know I could take this guy and make him number one at Google for local restaurants. I know I could do it. And you get really fired up with it. And then you talk to the client and it falls flat immediately. And I, I think that's what happens so often. Yes, that is so true, Dave. And I tell my clients this, fall out of love with your solution and fall in love with their problems. Because you can't do it. You can't, you can't do it. You can't do what you love or even what you think you're good at if the client won't let you in. And, and you gotta get out of your own yeah. way. You know what, when you say that, it literally reminds me of, um, I've been doing a lot of exercising around where I live and you see these gigantic Florida tortoises trying to cross the street and they get stuck when they come to the curb and they'll die in the middle of that street. Just like most of these business owners, just like these freelancers who don't make the connection and never the twain shall meet. And it's like that turtle where they're trying to get over that curb and they need a really good kick and it might hurt them but it's gonna get him over the curb so he can get to the lake and then survive. But that's what it reminds me of. Uh, let me ask you if you could briefly touch on some things that I wanted to get your take on. Could you talk about value-based pricing pros and cons of your service provider? I've seen it work for some people and then I've seen it break down completely with others. And maybe it goes back to the trust. I'm not sure that term has a very abstract term. A lot of people define it different ways, but I'll, right. I don't know what you're referring to, but all, all I know is I, I teach my clients how to charge the highest fee possible in their market. Well, for someone who's, for example, a web developer or a digital marketer, we're providing a service. It's an ongoing service. It takes time. So very commonly you'll hear, how much is SEO is if you're buying, you know, a bunch of bananas or something, how much is this? How much is that? And there it's a service. It's going to take time. I can start it, but it's got to run for X number of months. Then we look and see how much progress we're making, you know, whether it's organic or not. So when we talk about value-based pricing in a lot of cases, this is um, charging by the hour versus charging by the project. So well, usually with value-based pricing, that's what they're talking about. Should I charge by the hour and be an hourly employee or charge by the project? Neither. So, Don't do any of those two things. Charge on a retainer instead, not by the hour, not by time. So can you define that for anybody who's like a, a lay person completely new to sales? Sure. Okay. Sure. What you do is you charge a flat monthly rate. $3,000 a month, whatever your number is going to be. And you basically put everything in the sink underneath that number. You don't charge by the hour or by the service or this. You just say it's a flat fee of 3 k per month. That includes all the services inside that. So that is, yeah. So, I mean, okay, so I could walk into the equation and say, okay, well, look, uh, for, so for $3,000 a month, I'll take you, Mr you know, new business owner, and I'll build you a beautiful responsive website. I'll help you come up with the content. We'll basically launch like your startup. And so we're going to go, with, you know, $3,000 a month. Well, how long is this going to take, David? It should have a beginning and an end. Well, actually, it's an ongoing service. So it's Well, what I would do if I were you, I'd chunk this out by 90 day increments. I would say the first it's 90 days is each phase of the process. The first 90 days, you accomplish a goal for them to see this is for real. And it's website development or something they can see. In 90 days, you'll have this done where they feel like there is an endpoint there of value. Then 
Once that's going well and you're happy, we're happy, we go to phase two, which is the next 90 days, which is getting SEO up and running, backlinks and all that. Then phase three. So you have to chunk it out into a roadmap. They feel like they're not going to a rabbit hole with you that goes nowhere. Right. And so, and, and, and if your estimated overall budget would be 3000 I'm just saying this as an example because I'm not great at math. So if we say the overall project that you think you would build for would be 3000 for the completed website, then you would, you could divide that and just say, well, I'll divide that into quarters or something and take it like that and then do it for 90 days. And okay, by 90 days, the site is up, we've got the content and so yeah. on. So you got your monthly package right there that you could offer potential clients. No, nobody has a real budget set aside for any of this stuff. Just so you understand that it's a myth. There is no budget. I've seen people say that that's their budget, but obviously once you start talking to them, that breaks down very quickly. If, if what you're paying, if, if they're paying you money and you're helping them generate money for themselves through leads or through sales or through that, your, your fee is, becomes irrelevant to them over time. Because you're earning your keep and then some. So let me ask uh -huh. you. Yeah. Um, nope. Okay. Let me ask you what are like your your top three key sales myths that you see we in marketing or as business owners need to step away from or detox from? Well, the first one is a sales and numbers game. That's an old school guru thing where the more contacts you make, the more sales you make. Well, we discovered that's not true in this economy now. We discovered it's not about how many contacts you make anymore. It's about how deep you go on each conversation. How good you are at trust building, not how good you are, how many contacts you make. Number two is the idea of the sales loss at the end of the process and not the beginning. I'm sure you've been there before. You had a deal pending, good opportunity, lots of phone calls. It felt right at the end, just dropped through. It just dropped. Just, we just lost. Went, went, it just went away. Well, we discovered the sales not lost anymore at the end of the process. The sales loss at the beginning at hello. And I'll prove it to you right now in a fun way. If someone calls your office tomorrow morning, you pick up the phone and you hear hi. My name is, I'm with, we are a, what goes through your mind in about three seconds? What, well, initially my first thought is to, I hate to say it, but it's to begin explaining the services. No, no, I mean, if you were receiving a call like that from somebody and you heard someone say to you, hi, my name is, I'm with, we are a, what goes oh, through your mind? Well, on that, on that flip side of the equation, my first thought is how do I get off the, this call? Correct. It's I, 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 I got things I got to do. That's right. So I'm suggesting to you that a lot of your listeners and viewers right now are probably losing their sales, not at the end of the process, they're probably losing at the beginning. Right. Uh, and the last one is the idea of rejection. The, the rejection is part of the sales process. And we discovered that, that, that rejection is triggered certain things you say unknowingly that causes the other person to push back on you. And I'll share some of that if you want now. I've got five more minutes left and I'll share some insights if you like around that. Sure, that's sure, good. sure. That'd be great. So one of the triggers is, is is what I call languaging, the words that you use. Like people are so used to scripting and, and the old school way of scripting ideas. So we have we developed our own what we call trust-based languaging. Words and phrases to help you build trust with someone right away and, and to get the truth where they stand. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're on a, on a phone call with somebody. First conversation. Call is going well, good chemistry, seem like they're a good fit. Uh, call kind of comes to a close. Normally, we say things like what? We say, how about we follow up with each other, uh, move forward? How about we move towards the what? The sale. But what happens if you try and move somebody forward and they aren't ready yet? Well, yeah. you break with them right there. Yeah. You break trust. So same scenario, our approach. Call is going well good chemistry, call comes to an end, rather than saying the typical thing, which is, hey, how about we move forward? What we say instead is this, we say, where do you think we should go from here? So put it back on them. And what that, that when you say to somebody, where do you think we should go from here? They're usually in a state of shock. They can't believe 
somebody in business would actually ask them what they want to do. And what happens is they say things like, uh, I, I've got one more question. Or wait, what, what about this? What happens is what comes out is the truth. And that's your goal. Your goal is to shift your thinking to the truth so you know where you stand, so you're not chasing people who aren't going to buy from you. And that kind of concludes, I think, today's interview because that, that's the key big idea today is the goal is to stop selling, focus on trust instead. And that's really, that's really the, the big idea today. Okay. Well, let me just ask you, uh, Ari, um, if people want to learn more about your services or your book, um, how can they learn more about it? Well, the best thing is we have a complimentary course they can take right off the bat and learn more about this immediately. Just go to unlockthegame.com slash webinar, and you'll be able to download and watch the video right away that shows you more of this stuff and how to use it. And of course, unlockthegame.com website has a lot of resources there in my book as well. So I've got a new book I'm working on coming out next year called The One Call Sale, which will kind of, we can talk again if you want about that when that comes out, but that's pretty sure. much it for that. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And I hope uh, anyone listening or watching has gotten the value uh, that I have from uh, interacting with you, Ari. So thank you so much for your time. And for our listeners and viewers, thank you again for tuning in and hope to see you in our next episode. Thanks for tuning in to the David Summerfleck podcast. If you would like to apply to be a guest on the podcast or would like to ask a question we may use in a future episode, please go to www.dms.blue slash podcast guest. Thanks again for tuning in and hope to meet you in the next episode.